Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, everybody in between and beyond. Um, here in the library reading room, my name is Eshel Alpermann. I'm, I'm the head of the Policy Foresight Unit in EPRS. And I will talk you through the next 90 minutes, 86, um, where we will address the topic of foresight-based lawmaking how to make sure that our way of making law is fit for future generations. I'm joined here today in the library reading room and online by four distinguished guests. And in order of appearance, I welcome Ms. Ayaka Suzuki in New York, Mr. Stephen Quest here to my right, our member from the Finnish parliament, Mr. Timo Haraka from Helsinki, and here to my left, Trish Lavery. Thank you for being with us today. We will first look at the global level and then move to the European scene, then take an example from a national parliament before we round off by talking to a foresight practitioner with two distinct outside perspectives. On the proceedings. We will start this session with four bilateral talks. Then we will move into a round table discussion and please feel free to already comment on other speakers uh, before we then open up the floor for questions and answers. Unfortunately, um, m member of the parliament of Finland, Mr. Haraka has to leave us for an important vote in the plenary scheduled for four o'clock. So if you have questions to him, we will take them immediately after he spoke. You will be able to ask questions here in the room by raising your hand and online through the chat function, which my colleague Virginia Mayu will then read out for us. So she will be your virtual impersonation. So having dealt with this, we can move into medias res. Today, we will talk about how strategic foresight can help to better inform policymakers on the challenges of tomorrow. Strategic foresight is a structured and systematic way of using ideas about the future to anticipate and better prepare for change. Foresight can help to broaden the possibilities that policy experts are considering and help with contingency planning. But also, I think, we have to point out what foresight doesn't do. Foresight does not predict the future. The future is in our hands to change it. So let's get started. We now zoom out a little bit from our small continent and go global. And I would like to welcome my first guest online, Ms. Ayaka Suzuki. Uh, good morning to New York, Mrs. Suzuki. Hello. Um, we are glad to have you and that you could cut out some time in your busy schedule to join us here today. Let me briefly introduce you to our audience. For the last seven years, Ms. Ayaka Suzuki has been serving as the director of the Strategic Monitoring Unit in the Executive Office of the Secretary General of the United Nations, who has set out, as we heard earlier, the pivotal report our common agenda, which will lead up to the UN Summit of the Future in September this year. Ms. Suzuki also coordinates the recently established UN Futures Lab Network. And prior to that, she has headed UN missions to Libya and Haiti, had worked on peacekeeping and disarmament, armament, among many other things, one of which is worth mentioning in this um, framework. In the mid-90s, Ms. Suzuki also served as Program Director of Parliamentarians for Global Action. So there's a specific link also to the parliamentary level. Dear Ms. Suzuki, my first question would be, what triggered your interest in strategic foresight and which role does it play today in your thinking? Good afternoon. It's so great to be here today. Well, not there, but join you for this important uh, conference. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be amongst you. So, well, I'm very lucky to be working for a visionary boss like my um, 
uh, our Secretary General, uh, Secretary General Ant Antonio Guterres, because as you recall, in response to the UN 75 declaration, he issued this seminal report that you already mentioned, our common agenda, which set out a uh, vision for how the multilateral system can be better fit for purpose. And one of the key proposals among, among the many proposals that he set forth was for strategic foresight to be imbued in the way uh, multilateral system functions. So as part of that, we are now uh, doing two things. One is that uh, we are preparing a first ever uh, global report, uh, which also includes some strategic foresight element uh, that we will present to the, 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 to the, to the public uh, ahead of the summit of the future. But um, we are also, um, well, we have established the Futures Lab Network last year. We're in the process of operationalizing it because Future is not something that just happens to us. Many of you, uh, previous speakers, <clears throat> have just talked about future proofing, future proofing policies and decision making. We fundamentally believe that it is something we can shape and influence. I think you all uh, remember uh, COVID nineteen, which seems like a long time ago. The pandemic was a very stark reminder of our interconnected vulnerabilities. And it underscores the necessity for a more anticipatory approach in global governance. So that is why we're chartering a path towards a more anticipatory UN and through it, a more effective multilateral system by embedding strategic foresight in its decision-making and programming. And ultimately it's not about strategic foresight for its own sake. It is so that the, the, the multilateral system and the UN in particular can help its member states accelerate the implementation of the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Have a longstanding uh, track record on uh, her, their commitment to the future. And um, there's a promise even included in the United Nations Charter right at the start to save succeeding generations of war at that time. But this forward looking um, aspect of the United Nations has always been part of its DNA. Um, how would you frame its commitment for strategic foresight today? Yes, so we're at a very critical point. As um, one of the, uh, the speak previous speakers have mentioned, there is now a um, ongoing intergovernmental process that um, is underway uh, for the declaration for future generations, um, which is the process that is co-led by the permanent representative of the Netherlands and Jamaica. And we're very excited for its, its adoption at the summit of the future in September, uh, along with the pact for the future. And as I said, and the establishment of the future lab network. It's not a physical lab that's located in one location. It really is a decentralized network that empowers the UN system to use future thinking and strategic foresight by supporting teams and providing frameworks and building capacity to help shape, the, to help shape more resilient and anticipatory UN the world needs. So it is very much a priority of the Secretary General. And it also constitutes what we call one of the key five uh, quintet area of UN 2.0, data, digital, innovation, strategic foresight, behavioral science. You mentioned the um, summit for the future in uh, September. Um, and what do we, what, what can we expect from it? And what does the Secretary General expect from it as a follow up, as uh, if this is only seen as a building stone for future action? We're very excited about the, um, the, the, the Summit of the Future that's coming up in September. And as you know, a lot of work has already been underway. Last year, there was already a ministerial meeting on, um, on the margin of the General Assembly, um, which was very, very um, participatory. And um, as you probably know, the draft of the Pact of the Future has been issued. Um, it has received a very uh, robust uh, number of comments from member states and also multi-stakeholder um, as well. So uh, the, the the process is well underway to develop um, um, a pact of the future that should be adopted at the summit itself. 
But I mean, these events are really just rallying points. So the, the point is that we need to make a difference on the ground. And that is very much the objective and the spirit of the proposals that the Secretary General uh, laid out in our common agenda. I mean, in, in the report, there are over 80 or so uh, proposals. And some of them have to be taken at the intergovernmental level and others can be already being done without, uh, without any uh, intergovernment. So for example, this UN 2.0 idea that I just mentioned. So we are already implementing many of the proposals that the Secretary General set out in his, in his report that don't require intergovernmental um, approvals. So there's a lot of work underway, but obviously all of this needs to be done in very close partnerships with um, with, with 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 members, uh, member states, and partners. And our my my senior colleagues from the Secretary General's office are traveling all over the world, constantly uh, dialoguing and engaging with with our various partners. So thank you. You mentioned the the 80 measures that will um, give an impetus for foresight and, and politics, uh, which are included in the Charter. Um, you also touched upon the United Nations Futures Lab Network. That's a loose um, coordination under your control, if I understood correctly, not centralized, but in different agencies. Um, is there anything that has a spillover effect beyond the multilateral system in which you're working? And is there something in it that could be of benefit for governments and national parliaments alike? Great. Thank you for that question. So, uh, as, as I mentioned, um, Futures Lab is not necessarily an office or a physical unit uh, based in, in an office. I mean, uh, my office is contributing to that broader effort. But let me just step back a little bit. I mean, I think all of you who are practicing uh, trying to, uh, to, to introduce strategic foresight into um, your work is aware that um, it requires a shift in mindset from short-term reactive thinking to long-term strategic thinking. And it just doesn't happen just like that on a snap of the fingers. So what we're doing is uh, we have created kind of this interagency mechanism to first uh, to help capacitate parts of the UN system that have not yet developed the strategic foresight uh, capacity. So th this, this kind of capacity development is a very big part of the, the, the efforts of the strategic foresight um, network. The second part is connecting the dots. And there are these emerging strategic foresight uh, centers of excellence in different parts of the UN system, but they are disconnected. They have been disconnected. So we're bringing them together so we can benefit from each other's um, insights and, and, and thinking. And we are also uh, have created this uh, very active knowledge network, uh, what we call community of practice on strategic foresight. And by the way, we have community of practice in every five area all the five areas of UN 2.0, so that colleagues can share their best practices, their knowledge, um, their insights, et cetera. And then, and then lastly, uh, what we're really trying to double down on now is to better, uh, better support our decision-making mechanisms with strategic foresight. So um, we are making progress along these three main tracks of the Futures Lab. So obviously this is, a lot of it is internal facing mechanism because ultimately it's really about making UN that's better fit for purpose, that is more modernized, uh, that we can mainstream strategic foresight better. But obviously we cannot do this alone. Uh, and so parts of this uh, Futures Lab network are always engaging with other partners, including, of course, um, ER, uh, EPRS and other, because um, the European uh, European Union has many uh, centers of excellence yourself in the uh, on strategic foresight, but also with other networks. And we're increasingly trying to also identify and work with uh, colleagues in the global south as well, because this is a point that I actually really wanted to to make because I haven't heard this uh, much so far. The strategic foresight is, is a really powerful tool that can ensure that the voices of traditionally underrepresented groups 
such as smaller countries, indigenous communities, or marginalized population are uh, heard and integrated into policy planning. And, and that ultimately leads to more equitable global governance. And, and I, I think um, some of the, uh, the, the previous speakers already talked about the, the key principle of equality. And, and I think ultimately inclusive future is what's needed. I think this is a very nice a key message to take away from our chat and to thank you for the time being. Uh, we will come back to you in our discussion and I take the opportunity now to welcome our second guest. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Quest, and welcome here in the reading room. I'm pleased to have you here today as you hold two important roles, um, re both relating to today's topic you have served as uh, Director General of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission since May 2020, which is, with its 3,000 employees, uh, the Commission's champion for science-based policymaking and its in-house center for excellence for foresight and methodologies on foresight, offering also support to all other DGs in the Commission when they intend to do foresight work. And in addition, Stephen Quest, you are chairing the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System, the already mentioned ESPAS, which facilitates the collaboration of nine EU institutions and bodies on uh, long-term trends analysis and trying to figure out which challenges we will have to face in the EU. And it has been already mentioned by Vice President Angel um, that you are playing a crucial role in bringing together the Global Trends Report 2024 due out next month, which is right in time for the next five-year policy and legislative cycle in the EU. Dear Stephen Quest, um, before going into detail about your two hats as Director General and Chair of ESPAS, may I ask you a more general question? Why is strategic foresight so important for policymakers and legislators today across Europe and, as we just heard, globally indeed. Well, thanks, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here and um, welcome to everyone online as well. We've heard some good answers to that question already in the different, in the different presentations. I view foresight as a, as a capability, a capability that's useful to have in our policymaking toolbox as we look at the challenges that we, that we have ahead, and the previous speaker talked about shaping our future, I think foresight is exactly that, an important tool that we have to, to shape our future. Uh, even if it's not forecasting, it's not prediction, but it is something that we can use really to, to build on. If we look back at the various crises that we've had to deal with over the last couple of decades, whether it was 9-11, uh, whether it was COVID-19, whether it was the global financial crisis, unexpected things that came at us, but also we've got these more existential issues that are coming at us, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, the unknown potential positive and negative impacts of artificial intelligence and so on. There's a lot of complexity out there that we need to try and get our heads around. And how do we take a more long-term strategic view of this? Foresight, I think, offers a capability and a toolkit to enable us to, to look at those things in a, more, in a more coherent way. Some of the advantages of, of doing that are, I think, that it enables us to position ourselves better um, in this effort to shape the future because it gives us a better understanding of what's going on, hopefully. Not a perfect understanding, but maybe different perspectives and different aspects of understanding before we move in to act. So we're able to see a bigger picture before zooming in to act and a better understanding as well of the trends that are, that are coming at us. I think crucially, it also helps us to see interconnections. So as you widen your, your frame of vision, you not only see more things, but you have the potential to see how they join together. Uh, what are the synergies? What are the tensions? What are the trade-offs? And I think in, as policymakers, it's important to see those interconnections because what we see in, in our work in the Commission is that our policy colleagues are very focused on one specific domain uh, and trying to move forward a proposal or move forward action in one particular direction. But they're not necessarily looking across to their left or to their right at the colleagues who are equally doing the same thing. And they need help seeing how these different things connect together because the citizens 
as they experience policy, as they experience their interaction with government, are seeing the full picture, uh, not just isolated, isolated silos. So it's, for me, it's a, Foresight is about a toolkit uh, to help us better navigate these challenges, avoiding the risk of tunnel vision and, and better anticipating and better integrating what we're trying to do. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me just come back to the role of the Commission. So in the current mandate, for the first time, there is a portfolio for strategic foresight. And uh, this is attributed not just to a member of the European Commission's College, but it's the executive vice president who's taking care of this. Um, so a high-level assignment. Um, and since 2020, the European Commission has been issuing annual um, strategic foresight reports, uh, which are underpinned by the science uh, research you do at the JRC. Um, what are the effects of these first four strategic foresight reports? How has the thinking, the policy making in the Commission changed? Or could you even describe a few effects it might have had on shaping EU policies in the end when legislators were involved? Yeah, I mean, you're right that this has been, to my mind, an important development in, in this commission. The first time we had an executive vice president with a specific mandate to take forward work on foresight, which gave visibility to this practice, uh, to this capability, and it gave it a clear sense of, of direction. And it did encourage us to, to work better together across the different departments of the Commission. In the Joint Research Center, we, we had and we still have a, a capability, a competence center on foresight, which is part of our EU policy lab. But the, the inception of the strategic foresight reports has enabled us to join better together the scientific competencies and capabilities that we have to marshal facts and evidence and, and produce foresight reports with a higher level of interaction with the colleagues in the center of the Commission who are looking at the the work programming and the policy framing. And if we look now back across those four reports, they have, with reasonable success, picked up themes that have become and remained quite uh, impactful in this mandate. We, we've looked at resilience, uh, we've looked at open strategic autonomy, we've looked at the sustainability transitions, the green and digital transition. And those have all been themes of, of discourse and debate and policy action. And I think there's quite a good body of evidence to show that the work that we've been doing has helped play a role in shaping those debates. Now, it's not so easy to sort of go to foresight report number three and pick out page 27 and say, here's, here's the bit that is now translated across into this article in this regulation. It's not that kind of a you know, proof that I can, I can provide. But I, I would say there is a lot of indirect evidence that the interactions, both just the fact of producing these reports, being able to talk about them, using them to animate discussions and debates internally, interinstitutionally, internationally, has, it, has a positive effect in itself. Having something to talk about uh, to shape a debate is, is relevant, but also more, more direct uh, impacts. And if you look at some of the legislation the Commission has been proposing, uh, whether it's around the economic security package, whether it's around net zero industry acts, whether it's around critical raw materials, you can trace some quite direct lines between some of the thinking that was emerging in these foresight uh, reports and some of the legislative action that's, that's followed since. And then a final point about the, the impact of all of this is that it helps provide us uh, a good platform to build better communities of practice. So on the back of the fact that we're doing strategic foresight reports, we've densified the connections within the commission. There's, a, there's an internal foresight network bringing together colleagues from all the different services of the commission. So it's no longer just sitting in, in the JRC as a center of competence. It's, it's spread out across the commission, uh, the interinstitutional connections and the international connections. And I think that, that idea of a community of practice which can talk to each other and learn from each other is something as well which enriches all the different parts of the policy cycle. Yeah, thank you. You already mentioned um, the international and the interinstitutional cooperation uh, with your second hat on as um, chair of the ESPA steering group. 
um, to which my unit is happy to provide the Secretariat, by the way. Um, could you tell the audience a bit about what the purpose of this cooperation is and what it produces in concrete terms and um, how this output could be also useful for others potentially? So uh, the SPAS network is a really good example of interinstitutional cooperation. It, it works in, a, in an informal way, but that doesn't mean that it's not impactful. And the idea is very much to bring together practitioners from across the different institutions and to leverage their knowledge and produce input which can be used by policymakers across the different institutions. And this ranges from quite short-term work uh, around horizon scanning, where we're looking, we have a collective sensing network and we look for weak signals of change, which then we render in a, in a regular newsletter, which you can find on the, on the ISPAS website. Um, and again, these are not predictions. They're just weak signals of change of things which might become impactful or might not, but they're worth thinking about and it's to stretch out the vision of the policymakers, make them think perhaps outside of their normal field of vision. Uh, we also produce regular ideas papers and all of this leads up to uh, an annual uh, report every five years uh, called Global Trends where we try to look ahead at the, in the medium term period ahead and this report is designed to land at the beginning of each institutional cycle so we're now under pressure because we need to launch this report within the next month or so because then we get into the electoral period that Vice President Ongel was mentioning in, in June. And this is designed as a framing document to give food for thought to the incoming political leaders about what are the trends that we see coming at us, what are the potential implications of those trends, and what kind of choices might need to be taken if we want to uh, respond to those trends. It's not a manifesto or a policy document. It's a document putting flesh on the bones of trends that we see coming at us that we want to frame in a way that is appealing and, and hopefully digestible for, uh, for politicians and policy makers. So those are some of the activities. There are, there are more. We have an annual conference as well under the SBAS banner where we bring together practitioners and engage in, 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 in quite a vibrant debate. But it's a, it's a powerful tool which I think is, has brought a lot of value over the last 15 years. Okay, thank you. I'm just being informed that Ms. Suzuki has to leave us for an urgent appointment at uh, 3.30, which is right now. So thank you very much to New York, Ms. Suzuki, for joining us uh, today. And all the best, and hope to see you back in our circles and discussions again. This gives me the opportunity to welcome in Finland Mr. Timo Haraka, member of the Finnish Parliament, dear honorable member, Good afternoon to Helsinki, and thank you very much for taking the time to connect with us on such a busy day, uh, with even a vote of confidence scheduled in half an hour, or 28 minutes, which leaves us 23 for our uh, conversation, including questions and answers. Mr. Haraka is member of the Finnish parliament since 2015. He served as Minister of Transport and Communication in the cabinet of Prime Minister Sanna Marin from 2018 to 2023 and was deeply involved in data and AI legislation at EU level. Currently, he is the Vice Chair of the Committee for the Future and serves also on the EU Affairs Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee of his Parliament. Prior to his political um, career, he was an award-winning journalist and broadcaster who wrote columns for all major Finnish news outlets and hosted and produced current affairs programs at the National Broadcasting Company. Welcome, Mr. Haraka. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Let me ask you the first question to you. Um, you told me when we had our get to know chat that in Finland, future has a history. And indeed, more than 30 years, uh, passed since the Finnish government for the first time submitted a report on the future to the Edis Kunta. How did that come about? What was the source of this report at the time? Uh, thank you for the question and it's uh, a really an honor and, and joy to be this afternoon with you. And indeed, uh, 30 years uh, ago, back in the early 90s, uh, Finland was in deep recession 
uh, and we had uh, a ballooning unemployment and, and really difficult economic situation. And all kinds of desperate means and desperate ideas were uh, in dire need. And that's why uh, it, uh, it was necessary to look in the future to see what kinds of ways uh, for a better future there would be. And so uh, the vast majority of parliamentarians at that stage requested the government to produce their futures report. And uh, for the parliamentary side of it, we needed a temporary committee to review that document and, and comment on it. So uh, that's how Committee for the Future uh, was started. And later on, uh, it became permanent. And this uh, whole exercise of each and every government having to produce an annu uh, 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 a futures report uh, in each election cycle came uh, as a routine. I wanted to ask a follow-up question. So when you joined politics and entered into this um, foresight and future thinking, um, was there something that astonished you that you learned when you, when you became engaged in this area? Well, uh, indeed, uh, there has been a considerable development on all uh, aspects uh, of, of foresight in, in the government. So uh, there's also a foresight unit or strategic unit in the government, which uh, is uh, coordinating the government's uh, report, but each and every ministry have their own uh, foresight professionals that contribute to the government report. So uh, I, I was uh, surprised to see how ingrained, how embedded the, the, the anticipatory uh, process is in, in lawmaking. And this is something obviously that we want to continue with, that we want to improve upon, that we make sure that each and, each and every bit of legislation is future proof. And that, that is something that uh, we are proud of. And obviously, since ours was the very first Committee for the Future, uh, I get to uh, be asked about uh, what kind of committee is that uh, and what is it all about. Uh, there are, uh, depending on how you count, uh, around a dozen of similar committees, either uh, uh, future committees or digital committees or technology technology committees in parliaments and and this is a, a network that we very much hope that will bring the parliamentary uh, uh, dimension to uh, for instance the UN futures work and of course to the European Union uh, futures work. Yeah I'm jumping a little bit a few more questions and go to the very last I wanted to ask you uh, as the next one. Uh, you mentioned the um, cooperation between parliamentary committees uh, for the future on the future. Uh, there was a first conference in Helsinki two years ago and a second one took place last year in Montevideo. I noticed there were 20 different parliaments represented, uh, but only four took part in both uh, conferences. Is there one way to make this a stronger cooperation? Are other parliaments open to join this cooperation? Um, what will the future bring for, for this initiative? Well, obviously, uh, there are vast differences between countries and, and also uh, uh, parliamentary systems. Uh, that, so there's no uh, simple solution, one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, for instance, uh, it's probably easier for our colleagues in Iceland to kind of emulate the example of Finland. But uh, then uh, we have futures committees in Chile and in Uruguay, which operate in a totally different environment. So what we're trying to put together is some kind of, if not a guidebook, but some kind of uh, shared experiences, best practices on, on, on committees of, for the future. And we are doing this in cooperation with the UNDP and, and uh, kind of making uh, it easier for other parliaments to, to follow suit if they so wish. But I also want to stress another thing that has come up uh, earlier today is interinstitutional 
cooperation and this on a global level. So what I really wanted, want to see is both uh, institutions that deal with foresight, with uh, legislation and, and, and governance that use anticipatory methods, as well as obviously the scientific community to work closer together and produce uh, a fruitful dialogue on, on, on various scenarios of the future. Thank you. I see you are not afraid of uh, foresight and uh, looking ahead into the future. But I could imagine that um, some members of parliaments where this tradition is not yet so long established and embedded might have second thoughts about foresight reports, which are based on wide consultations of citizens, stakeholders, um, experts, um, and then presented to the parliament as the latest wisdom. Um, and how far does this leave you as a parliamentarian, as a politician elected on a political manifesto? Uh, leave, get, and how far does it give you still room for political maneuver? Um, if everything is pre-cooked, do we still <laughs> need political parties then? Well, uh, hardly any political party is uh, disagreeing with the fact that what we want it's a safe and a good future for, for the next generations. The only difference is that we are not always aligned with the means uh, to, to, to get to that future. So uh, interestingly, uh, during all these three decades of this committee, there has not been a vote once. So we've never voted on anything uh, because uh, since future is uncertain and there are uh, competing scenarios uh, so it would be kind of absurd to have a vote on things that uh, are uh, in the field of prob probability or even possibility instead of facts so what that means is that if there is a disagreement so what we can do is always add another scenario to 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 please those that uh, were not uh, entirely pleased what the outcome was before and that is exactly uh, that kind of, uh, I think, uh, uh, cooperation uh, that is needed in order to, to enhance fact-based, evidence-based uh, uh, governance and, and policy making that I think is more needed today than ever. Yeah, more needed today than ever. Um, one of your neighbors is Russia and... Um... Finland must always have had a closed eye on what's happening next door. Um, so what kind of foresight scenarios, scenarios did you develop on Russia? Was there a scenario seeing Russia as an assertive hegemon that is invading its neighbors? And um, did in the end developing scenarios that included this, did that help shape the opinion, shape consensus in parliament to give up Finland's neutrality and to join NATO? Well, indeed, uh, back in 2007, that's more than 15 years ago, and much before even the Russian annexation of Crimea, uh, the, the Committee for the Future produced a report on uh, various scenarios of Russia. On the one end, we were uh, hoping for a Europeanized, democratic uh, and, and, and uh, market-oriented uh, good neighbor. And on the very end of that spectrum, you would have an, an aggressive uh, and, and, uh, and uh, expansionary, uh, brutal uh, uh, Russia that actually became pretty much uh, how it turned out to be. And uh, these scenarios helped us understand uh, the vast uh, uh, array of possibilities that, that would uh, uh, come to Russia. And indeed, uh, that option was always uh, in our minds uh, when we were seeing the development, the un un unfortunate development of Russia, and certainly had its own impact on on. Uh, on, on, on us uh, anonymously uh, joining uh, NATO. And certainly uh, there were quite a lot of people uh, who could 
then point out uh, to the old report and say, well, we told you so. Um, Stephen, would you have a comment on Mr. Haraka's statement? Um, well, I mean, uh, it, it's great to hear the Finnish example, and I think it's been an inspiration uh, for, for a lot of people, the way that you've embedded this capability in the institutional uh, machinery and, and the fact that the, the process encourages Parliament to actually look at this in a, in a structural way, because it also de-dramatizes it. Um, and it, uh, it encourages the forward thinking rather than the reactive thinking. You know, we just look at this when, the, when there's a crisis. So I think it's been uh, quite, quite an inspiring um, example. I mean, maybe if I can ask a question. I mean, you talked about um, sharing good practice or best practice. Would you, would you share a couple of examples of what, what would you consider to be particularly good practice that others might want to, might want to sort of pick up on or note down? Um. Thank you for, for a great question. Uh, 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 may I point out that there is uh, uh, a commentary by Jana Tapanan in Thies, uh, who is uh, in charge of the strategic uh, department of the government, which is uh, more specific on, on the government's futures report. So if you're interested, you should read the, 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 the comments section. But uh, I think the most important thing is that it's an ongoing process when uh, the government is producing uh, those reports and we scrutinize uh, them and we give our opinion and we have our requests how to improve things and what kind of uh, developments or emerging technologies they need to take into account and to kind of uh, envision how they change the landscape. And they are obliged to, to answer to us uh, annually and each, each year. And it's up to us in the parliament to decide whether we are satisfied with that kind of an answer or, or a vision, or should we kind of reiterate uh, our demands? And there are some points that we've been uh, uh, requesting over and over again, and this is something that uh, forces the government, uh, of which I've been uh, part of uh, earlier, so I know what I'm talking about from both sides of the aisle, uh, to to really think hard on 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 that that foresight process. And as I as I said earlier. Uh, it's it's been uh, uh, tremendously uh, uh, improved uh, throughout the years. So far, that also when government is making their own proposals, each and every law proposal they do, legislative proposals. So there is a future uh, element embedded, not only as a separate headline, but also embedded in each and every paragraph. So uh, this is. Uh, uh, I think a huge learning experience, a huge learning curve for all the staff of all the ministries. Now we're waiting just for one thing, namely that these reports will all be translated into English. Actually, there is one, uh, a very uh, topical and interesting report that's been, uh, the first version was made uh, uh, 10 years ago, and it's ha also already has a successor. It's called 100 Radical Technologies. And that is uh, a very interesting document because you see a decade of, of, of uh, foresight on emerging technologies and you can see which really did emerge and which did not emerge as much as uh, wanted. But that's in, in, in English. So if you're interested, yeah, you will easily find it. We will do so and send the link around. I saw there was one question uh, from in the first row. Frank Dubier, I'm the head of uh, the library here. And I have a question, and not having read your, your report, about the balance between the big things and the smaller ones in uh, your work. Big things, Russia, energy, future of technology, future of the economy. There are also many smaller things that matter a lot for the individual and then for the policy which is mental health, the future of uh, food, aging. How much was that present in your work? Thank you very much. That's a great question. And uh, there is a concept uh, in general that is called the well-being economy that is kind of integrating those uh, personal and health issues and, and social issues uh, to a kind of a Nordic uh, framework that is uh, 
also uh, something that combines uh, the work of Icelandic uh, committee and ours. But since there are 17 members in our committee, just like in any other committee, so the personal, uh, personal uh, preferences of each and every member will be represented in the reports we make. So we are, we are very open and we are very uh, uh, free to, to uh, kind of request reports on, on a wide variety of subjects, whether they have geoeconomic consequences or whether they are very much more closer to everyday life of each and every uh, citizen. Uh, I, and I think this variety uh, is hugely important. Thank you very much, uh, Timo Haraka. Uh, I think we now have to respect your duties as a member of the parliament and let you go to the plenary vote, important as it is, at four o'clock. And thank you very much. I hope to have you once more here in the future, um, talking to you again. And bye-bye to, to Helsinki. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. Uh, have a great conference. Thank you, and bye-bye. Now we are back in the room, and I welcome here to my left, Trish Lavery. You have come all the way from Canberra, and I hope you have recovered well from the trip. Thanks for being with us today at this uh, conference. And let me also introduce you briefly, like all our other speakers. Um, Trish Lavery is um, a strategic, strategic foresight practitioner who is about to take up a post as uh, the director in the Australian government's department of prime minister and cabinet. Prior to that, she worked in several roles, including as strategic foresight counselor in the OECD. And she is a member of the OECD's expert group on AI futures. Trish Lavery has a PhD in climate science and uses her background in behavioral psychology to put human behavior at the center of futures thinking. Dear Ms. Lavery, you're taking up a post as director in the Australian government next Monday. And foresight is a new capacity being built in your country's government. Let me simply ask you, why does your government engage in foresight right now? Ah, great question. And first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. It's an honour to be here. Um, we've recently had a review in the Australian government that looked at the, the current status and really making sure that we were the best placed for future changes. And as part of that, we had foresight that came up as something that we weren't doing as much of as we could. Uh, lucky we have some very innovative leaders that have really taken that message on board. So I'm very thrilled to have been called back to Australia uh, to lead to um, contribute to that work in helping to build the foresight capacity in uh, the Prime Minister and Cabinet and across the um, public service. So I will be certainly, I've been taking lots of notes from our Finnish counterparts and our earlier speakers to, to guide me in that work. Okay, I see we have established already good connections during this conference. Um, let's take a look at your work at the OECD, so your prior engagement there. Um, oftentimes strategic foresight suffers a lot from short-termism. There's uh, the day-to-day -day challenge that is more pressing than the, the long-term thinking and developing foresight. Um, I believe that our audience would be quite interested in getting to know a little bit more uh, what you encountered when you been working at the OECD um, and what will be uh, important for parliamentarians um, in the near future so that we can convince them to, to take serious uh, foresight work rather than the short-term orientation till the next election. Um, do you have examples of that where this engagement of parliamentarians worked? Yes, great example. Look, um, in thinking through some of the issues that will soon be on the radar if they're not already of parliamentarians, one of the big ones for me that I've been tracking, given my, um, I have a climate science background, as you mentioned, uh, is the change, the sort of step change that we saw in 2023 in our environmental metrics. 
Um, we've seen a change last year beyond anything we've seen before. Oh, many of the environmental uh, records were thrashed last year and, and not in a good way. Uh, we've got climatic conditions now that in some cases we haven't seen for tens of thousands of years. And if you had asked me as a climate scientist to draw a graph of what crossing an environmental tipping point might look like, last year's graphs are what I would have drawn and the trend is continuing this year. So if you haven't seen those recent graphs from about June last year, I encourage you to look them up. They're absolutely terrifying. Um, so we will st start to see much more frequent and severe weather events and we will approach lethal temperatures in some parts of the world where we have already been approaching, but we will see those approaches uh, more frequently in the future. And what we know from you know, the world of behavioural psychology is that when citizens experience the, um, climate change for themselves in a very personal way through a severe weather event, for example, it changes their perceptions about what should be done and it leaves them much more readily um, calling for action. Against that backdrop, in 2023, we saw the release of three really large reports from UNEP, the European Commission and the White House on what has previously been a dirty word, solar radiation management. This is a geoengineering technique. It generally involves launching rockets into the stratosphere and releasing something like sulfur dioxide, which sort of creates a cloud, if you like, around the globe. And it causes the sun's rays to reflect back into the atmosphere. It would cool the, it would cool the earth if we were to undertake this. We know that. It would cool the earth. Uh, it's the only thing we know that would cool the earth on the time frames that we will need to cool it. And it's relatively affordable. We're talking on the range of about uh, 18 billion US dollars per year per degree cooled. So it's achievable for most developed nations. Now, it doesn't solve any of the underlying climate or environmental problems that we have at the moment. It's just sort of masking them, if you like. And we don't, what we don't know is about the unintended consequences of this technology. There's models that suggest that it could disrupt, for example, the hydrological, um, the hydrogeological cycle. So it could interrupt with patterns of rainfall. Uh, it could disrupt monsoons, for example. We just don't really know. But here's where it gets really interesting. You, once you start solar radiation management, SRM as we call it, you need to keep going. You kind of enter into a cycle of substance dependence. And the reason for this is because, say if you engaged in solar radiation starting today for 10 years, perhaps with the goal to keep warming within the Paris target of 1.5 degrees, which we've almost certainly passed now, and then you stopped after 10 years, the, te the global temperature would rebound very quickly, not back to the temperature today, but to where the temperature rise would have been over those 10 years had you not engaged with it at the start. And this is a problem. Biological systems are not, have not evolved for huge jumps in temperatures over time scales of months. So this sort of, this sort of sudden stopping, what's called termination shock, could be quite catastrophic. So when we're thinking about this, as foresight practitioners, we love these kind of problems. They're the sexy and fun and frightening problems that we love to get into, and we tend to jump quite into the, into the distance. It's what we're trained to do as foresight practitioners. So we're thinking about the deployment of, um, you know, of, of solar radiation management. We're thinking who will control the world's thermostat? How will we make sure all citizens have a role in deciding this? Who will deploy it? Who will deploy this technology? Given that once we start, we need to keep going, are we going to leave this, jobs, uh, this job to democratic governments that could be voted out in the next few years? Is autocratic governments a better option? Or should we maybe turn it over, perhaps there will be a billionaire that turns his attention from space down to Earth and says, I've got this, I've even got the rockets ready, and we could end up in kind of like a subscription model for the Earth's future. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? 
But I thought Stephen said something really interesting earlier. You see the big picture, and that's what we love to do with these terrifying futures, and then you zoom in to act. So when thinking about that, that's a lot to take on for a regulator and a lawmaker to start to envisage that world and how we would regulate it. But zooming in to the more near term, we can start to think through some of the issues that we really should be thinking as regulators uh, very quickly. We can't research solar radiation management without doing it. It's a global process. So how are we going to govern the research? How are we going to decide on the scale of these tests should we decide to undertake them? And how will we discern that we, how will we ensure that we can discern the effects of individual tests, particularly if more than one is going on at the, at the same time? And how will we manage the risk of unintended consequences, whether real or perceived? Because if one of these tests happens and at the same time the monsoon is disrupted, whether or not there is an actual physical link between those two events might become less important than whether the citizens perceive there is a link. So I think, you know, when using foresight, it's great to let your foresight people do the big, sexy, long-term thinking and then drill it back in, zoom back in, in, in Stephen's word, for, for the opportunity to act today. It sounds like a very thrilling engagement <laughs> that you are going to undertake there. Um, do you have another example where um, important questions for regulators and parliamentarians, in fact, uh, today, um, are already um, linked to unwanted consequences or developments or crisis that might occur in 10, 15 years? Mm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm lucky to be in a job because I get excited by really difficult pro problems. So I think I'm definitely in the right job. Um, so, as you mentioned earlier, I have a background in behavioural psychology and I'm particularly interested, you know, we're all talking about artificial intelligence at the moment, and I'm particularly interested in looking at a future and whether artificial intelligence is going to empower us as citizens or disempower us. Um, because humans act in weird and wonderful ways that sometimes at the face of them don't seem to be particularly rational. And I'm a strong advocate for, in our futures work and our policy planning, trying to work with how humans actually behave and not how we think. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. If you had told me 15 years ago that almost everyone I know would open a large legal document, go to the end and sign it without reading it, even though they had been told that there were clauses in that document that, that make them feel a bit uncomfortable, all so that they could share photos of their lunch with their friends, I might have said something like, why would anyone do that? That's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. No one would do that. But actually, humans have a range of cognitive limitations and biases that, you, they, that we use to help us navigate the complexities of the world around them. And by understanding these, it might have helped us better predict how humans would respond to the advent of Facebook in this case. Humans are social animals. We're so driven by what people around us are doing. Your chance of putting a, a solar panel on your roof, for example, is not best predicted by the costs and benefits, which are determined by your local government subsidies, etc. It's by how many people in your street have solar panels. That is the biggest predictor. Because we think that other people have thought through things uh, more deeply than we have time to do. Thinking exerts a huge biological cost on us. And, you know, um, we live in a complicated world, so we use a range of sort of cognitive shortcuts and biases to help us kind of make sense of, that, of, that, of the complicated world that we live in. And some of these make more sense than others. My favourite cognitive bias is called the rhyme is reason effect, just because it's completely ridiculous. It tells us that humans are more likely to believe a sentence that rhymes than one that doesn't. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. And we can test this by giving laboratory subjects and asking them, do they believe the, the line, 
wisdom, um, anger restrained is wisdom gained. And a lot more people believe that than anger held back is wisdom gained. That doesn't really appeal to people. So we have these weird and wonderful things that we're battling with as humans. Uh, another one that I really love is the, what we call the intention-action divide. And this is kind of the battle that some of us, maybe more than others, wage with how we want to be, how we say that we want to be, and how we act to actually act in real life. And anyone who's failed at a diet, failed to give up smoking or cut down drinking knows what I'm talking about here. I, have, I am the Trish that wants to set my alarm early every morning and get up and go to the gym and practice my French. But I have this nemesis that stays up too late reading trash freak fiction with no educational benefit and then turns off the alarm that I set in the morning in favour of the hour of sleep, the extra hour of sleep. And this is a nightly battle. In an AI-enabled future, I want uh, nudges that help me become more like the person that I want to be. I want an AI assistant that's monitoring my sleep cycles through the night so that it can wake me up, not at an arbitrary time, but at a time in my sleep cycle when my sleep is the lightest and it's much, much more easy to wake up at that time. But what I fear in this AI-enabled future is a world in which huge amounts of personalised data about me are being used by third parties against me and when I'm at my most vulnerable, when they're using it to nudge my behaviour in ways that meet their objectives, not my own. At the moment, we have huge amounts of funding um, coming from tech companies into brain second sensing technologies. And these already exist in the form of, you know, earbuds that can pick up your neural waves, um, hats and headbands. And unfortunately, when you start to think about the future possibilities of that, it's not going to be possible for any of us to opt out, say, oh, I'm just not going to wear those earbuds. It's not going to work like that, unfortunately, because there's a huge amount of redundancies in these systems. So we could see, for example, um, a, a tech company paying 10,000 people to wear their brain sensing technology while interacting with their platform. And from that, they'd probably have enough data to extrapolate to the rest of us by picking up things like microfacial expressions, posture changes, and you know, information from Fitbits and things like that that we have. So thinking about that future and zooming in on where we act today, uh, how are we going to protect citizens from this when the line between persuasive marketing and outright manipulation becomes blurred or crossed? Because it's not enough to say, oh, we'll have to educate citizens on, I know, you know, lots of us know, lots of us feel uncomfortable with how our attention is being um, hijacked by some of the apps that we interact with. I have a behavioural psychology background. I know that when I'm scrolling through social media, it's giving me intermittent reinforcement rather than constant, because that is the most powerful. And yet I find it very hard to resist that dopamine hit when I'm scrolling. So how do we protect um, citizens from this future in which big data and AI, I mean, you know, we, we have this, you know, constant nudging in a way that's driven by third parties? How are we going to protect vulnerable citizens, such as children? What happens when large companies have data on us that we don't have access to? Because through these sorts of sensing technologies, you can start to pick up on things like early signs of cognitive decline or other changes in your health. So we're looking at a situation where other companies will have data about me that I don't know myself. Are we happy with them using, using that data to market to us? Are we happy with um, our, our employers using that data to make employment decisions about us? These are some really big questions that uh, we're going to have to answer in, in the quite near term. When you say in a quite near term, could you put a figure to it? Well, those, those, some of these neural sensing devices are already being used. So, um, for example, there's been a smart cap that's been around for ages. And I think we can all get on board with the idea this is used by truck drivers and miners, and it measures fatigue levels. So that's great. None of us want a truck driver, you know, driving off the road and falling asleep at the wheel. 
But as part of that, as I mentioned, that the, the data that's measuring fatigue, you can also infer a lot more from that. So you have employers in a, in a situation where they might be able to see the, the, the effects of, say, early um, cognitive decline. So uh, it, it raises some really interesting questions. And there are some employers that make um, the, around the world that are making decisions about employment based on that data. So. I'd say sooner rather than later, we might have to start dealing with these issues. So it's an issue which is immediately going to land on lawmakers' desks, probably. You also um, are part of the OECD AI Futures Experts Group, and um, you're trying to inform policymakers on the risks and opportunities that are linked to AI. Um, what do we have to prepare for when looking into an, an AI-enabled future? Mm. And where do politicians have to pay particular attention? Mm. Great question. Yes, I'm, I'm part of this group and it's been really influential. And it examines lots of the, you know, we're a multidisciplinary group that's been convened to advise governments on the future of AI. And there's lots of futures and tech people on that panel. And of course, we love to jump to the sexy futures. Um, one of the things we've looked at is whether AI could represent an existential risk to the human species. And by that, I mean, could it wipe out enough of the species so that even if a few of us are holed up in bunkers somewhere, we'll never be able to rebuild the society that we have today. And when you think about this, um, we assume that this would be driven by what we call AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. And this is where autonomous machines are at the human level or beyond on a broad spectrum of domains and contexts. And when we think about how humans might be able to control something that's tens or hundreds of times more intelligent than themselves, the best analogy I've been given is thinking about how a toddler might try to control an adult. You know, they might put the adult in jail by pulling some couch um, cushions off the couch and laying that on the floor around the adult. But of course, as an adult that's multiple times more intelligent than a toddler, we know that we can just step over or just push the cushion aside. And if you're, you know, any of you are raising a future leader, you might you know, know that you could actually sneak out, grab your cup of tea and be back innocently in jail before your future leader knows that you've even gone. So when thinking about that, um, it's interesting to start to think through and very challenging to think through how we would regulate something that's tens of times more intelligence than us. And when we ask the AI experts in this group about the possibilities of that, it's, it's far from uniform. In fact, it's almost a bimodal distribution of half of them saying, no, 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 this is not a credible risk. We don't have to worry about this. It's not going to happen. And the other half saying, yes, yes, it is going to happen and sooner than we think. So that, that's a bit hard for, for regulators then to, to deal with. But Keeping on the theme of zooming back in, uh, which I really like, um, when we ask them to think about what should be on the radar right now, what our experts tell us is, is tend to talk about more is artificial capable intelligence. And that's when AI machines are capable of stringing together a series of sort of complex and, um, and real-world tasks with pretty light oversight from any humans. And the example is that, you know, my 12-year-old could decide to, you know, ask an AI bot to find him a business, to set up a business for him selling Pokemon cards online. And the AI would do most of the sourcing of the cards and the setting of the website. And, you know, we would still need a human to sign on the dotted line at certain points, like creating the bank account where the sales money will go into. But most of the work is being done by AI. And our experts tell us that this is about, you know, possibly as soon as two years away um, with our current um, technologies. So that really raises some questions for lawmakers and regulators. Um, how will companies, you know, be pushed to be less cautious in their AI systems integration if, you know, if this is a really competitive advantage for them? Who is responsible for tracking the actions of the AI that are occurring behind the scenes? Is my 12-year-old with his Pokemon cards uh, responsible for understanding how that system works and, and monitoring, um, making sure it's doing everything ethically? Um, how are we going to develop the kind of 
agile regulation that we need because often when these things come in and we saw this with social media we didn't understand the consequences at the time if we had we might have done the regulation a bit different so how do we design regulatory systems that are agile so that as society becomes more aware of the risks the the regulation can evolve as part of that and if technology if these technologies are made in an open source matter who is responsible if um, sort of uh, malicious actors use that software in, in ways that wasn't originally envisaged by the creators? So I think these are sort of the more immediate sort of small, small term, uh, short term concerns that regulators and lawmakers need to be thinking about before we uh, look at the, the, the bigger, like far um, reaching questions like existential risks. Not that we should be completely have those off the tables, by the way. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we now move to a quick interludium uh, where we have a quick exchange on the podium before then um, handing over the possibility to you in the audience online and um, live to ask questions. If you're doing this online, please use the chat function. If you are here in the room, please raise your hand. Um, we already quickly touched upon the um, question of the importance of the time scales in, in foresight. And at the same time, I am recalling that the legislative cycle in the EU can take up to 10 years. It takes us about two years to come to an agreement on a proposal. Then after three to six years, there is a review and possibly a new um, proposal. So I wanted to ask you, Mr. Quest, what would be the ideal moment to embed foresight in such a policy and legislative cycle? And then to come back to you and ask you about the time dimension. Yeah, well, that was fascinating. Um, series of uh, replies, really interesting to listen to. I think the I mean, there's, I would embed foresight everywhere, upstream, in the middle, and downstream, because I think then you optimize your chances of, of having the impacts that you, that you want to have. Uh, and I think it, it, it comes through the, the, the previous answers there that this is a very, very challenging environment because we're talking about future-proofing regulation when there is stuff coming at us so fast with so much uncertainty that we can't keep up. So it's, I mean, there's a, there's a big gap between having legislation that can keep up and is vaguely fit for purpose, let alone making it future-proof. I mean, this is, a, this is a significant stretch goal. Plus, you've got the issue that even when you regulate, you assume that people are going to behave and respond in the way that you hope they're going to respond, and the evidence shows that they... Uh, that they don't and, and it was interesting to hear you because we've in, in in my setup the behavioral scientists are sitting next to the foresight practitioners and so we, we bring these things together and we're doing some work exactly at the moment to look at how how do people respond to ai in real life and they don't respond in the way that you might expect them to respond or the way that you would assume that they would respond and so it, it just strikes me there's a lot of uncertainty between how people respond versus what you think they're going to do, the present day problems and the future. And then the other issue is this, this issue of who has agency and what are the, who are the actors that you're regulating? Because a lot of what's coming at us now, it's, it seems to me, is, is not following the normal patterns that we've had in the past. Uh, so, I mean, how do you view AI? Is it, for me, parts of what you get through AI, it's almost like an infrastructure provision. And normally you expect, at least in a start phase, infrastructure to be provided through the nation state, you know, whether it's electricity or water or whatever. These are, these are sort of public goods to an extent. But now we're moving into a terrain where a lot of these public goods, or what will become public goods, are being provided by non-state actors. And that, I mean, there are ways of regulating that, but when it's happening in real time, before you even have a chance to think about the regulation, I think there's some really difficult, knotty issues to, 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 to get into. So to come back to your question, I think the more you can embed 
the foresight thinking and stretching out your perspectives upstream, but also downstream, the better equipped you're going to be to adapt, uh, adapt along the way. But it strikes me that we also need to look at adapting actually how we do regulation, because we just can't keep up. Uh, and that's um, maybe a, a bigger challenge for the rest of this event to, to lean into. Um, uh, and I think foresight and other tools can, can help that conversation. But uh, it's a big challenge in my view. Thank you. That's a very good answer to my question because it really nicely segues over into the following uh, discussions, which will be the second panel on ex ante impact assessment and the third on ex post evaluation. And if you do foresight across the policy cycle, then we will come to that, back to this point at a later stage again. So is there the ideal time scale? Or does this depend on different factors? Yeah, great question. And I, I, re I really agree with that. My heart sunk, to be honest, when you, you were outlining the, the timelines associated with getting some of these laws, you know, into, into, into play. And I think, you know, it, it, it's not fit for purpose in the world that we have today. So, and that, that's a big issue and a big, and a big statement. And in terms of the timeframes, you know, for foresight, I think we've, we've got to think broadly, you know, the aim of foresight is to expand and, and consider different possibilities. It's not to predict one possibility, you know, not to predict one probability and tell you that that's what you should regulate for. Um, so I think we have to give foresight practitioners the opportunity to do their thing, to think the really broad um, thinking, the long-term scales. Um, but then I often think of it as sort of creating the roadmap back from that. So, you know, the, the, you know, if you look at your future scenario for 2040, for example, then how did you get there? What were the steps? And in the, the earlier example of, of of AGI and, you know, existential risks or whether we should, you know, you can start to look at that ahead and then, you know, think, well, ACI, the, the one that can set up a business, that one's, you know, that's, that's a step along, but possibly we should be starting to consider all of those time horizons when we're, when we're thinking through and in that sort of staged approach, understanding a little bit, trying to think through the sequence at which these things are going to happen and building our regulations so that it can be a kind of step-by-step -step approach where, where you're tackling one thing with a view to the, to the broader future. Okay, thank you very much. Now, are there any questions from the virtual floor, please, Virginia? Hello, you can hear me. Excellent. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions and a comment uh, by an online attendee, uh, Mr. Jonathan Cave. And actually, Trish was just mentioning that the first comment relates to the fact that, yes, foresight is um, it's about both anticipating risks and st structurally ex uh, exploring the future, but also about creating that strategic vision and, uh, and, and framing it so that it's, um, so that it's resilient. Um, and then the question, uh, first question is, um, Maybe either of you have experience with this. How can you convince policymakers not to favor scenarios that already rationalize their pre-existing policy preference? Because this is a bias that you might come up, of course, when we're doing our foresight work. Um, and so do we have hope for a, a real options perspective that takes into account uh, what we might not actually do or not do um, today? Uh, so that's one. And then there's another question that's also very interesting. Um, is, is there scope for considering the wisdom of crowds or behavioral intelligence um, within uh, the foresight systems? Because um, that may give us more information to be able to anticipate. And, and that also relates to the last point, which is, can AI actually help with this? Is, um, doing foresight on AI is very difficult, but can AI help us do foresight? Think about it. Would you like to start? Yeah, I can jump in there, absolutely. And I think we were um, discussing something similar over lunch today. When we look at, uh, regarding the, the question about policy makers and their preferred, you know, preferred future and how they sort of tend to go that. And I think, you know, by being really, I often think of it as, as, as a gift to future policy makers. You know, I've sat in government for a long time and often we end up with a, you know, a situation where we've got a five-year plan and we all now realise that it's, you know, terribly flawed, but it, we've got to keep going until the date on the end of it, you know, and then we can change it then, you know. Um, and that, that's obviously not an ideal scenario. So if we can have a look at scenarios and say, okay, we've got these range of different scenarios and we've made this plan, assuming these, you know, these couple of futures are going to, 
to, to come. And what we didn't make this plan for is these events here, these black swan events. And if they happen, we need to throw this out and start again. You know, as a policymaker, that would be such an amazing gift to say, you know, something's changed. This is now, you know, this is now no longer the preferred option. Um, but let's start again, even though we're not at the end of the time frame on the reports on the reports cover. So I think, you know, we, we've been really clear on what scenarios you have developed a plan for, and sometimes maybe they'll be the, the preferred ones that we're all hoping, but being also really clear on when we have to rethink this because the world has changed and we didn't plan this plan for those particular, those particular conditions and contexts. Yeah, thank you. Is the question on AI tempting you? Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that we're, we're certainly looking at. Um, how can you mobilize the power of AI to make better sense of what you already have? So I mean, one of the things we've done in the Joint Research Center is, is in-house some of the current uh, generative language models that are out there so that we can put more of our own in-house information into them without um, having to share it with the cloud and with the, with the suppliers, all of this legally, of course. Um, but but to enable us to make more sense of our own of our own information. So I think there's a potential for using these capabilities to understand better and to and to know what you know. Certainly one one of the challenges the JRC has is we know a lot of things, but we don't necessarily all know what we know. So even even just that that piece of the puzzle is is, is AI can definitely help us. And I and I'm sure that there are there's a potential to help us build more robust or, or more interesting scenarios going, going forward. If I can, just on the scenario question, the, the problem that I, I always have is that our scenarios tend to end up being at the extremes and therefore none of them are attractive to the politicians. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I, I always try and explain that we're, we're trying to sort of build a wind tunnel that will test the robustness of the policies when, ex when, when exposed to the most extreme events. And these are not desirable outcomes. They're they're stress tests. So if this is your policy, how, how robust is it going to be if, if this wind is blown at it or this earth, earthquake happens to it? And that kind of helps, but then they still come back and say, well, that's great, Stephen, but, you know, where's the happy policy? Where's the happy scenario? Because that's the one, that's the one that I want. But it's, my answer is, well, that's what you put in your manifesto. You know, that's what you put in your, in your mission letter or your guidelines. Um, but the, the foresight activity is more helping you to, to, to test the robustness of the particular solutions that you come up with as well. Yeah, I see no further questions from the online audience, so maybe you make a comment. comment. Yeah. Can I just make a quick comment and reflection on that? Because it's, it's so true that the, we have a huge um, tendency to want to avoid the negative conversations, you know, and I think we've all been told uh, you know, don't come with problems, come with solutions. And some of these issues that we're facing don't have solutions. They're incredibly complex and it's hard to talk about them. I find it hard to talk about the climate data sometimes because there is very little good news there. And it's such, I feel the pressure on not to be a downer when I'm up here and, you know, give the audience a good time. But, you know, and that's something that a lot of people face at work and it can be difficult. And having these hypothetical scenarios frees people to be so much more open about the risks and um, the concerns that they're having today, um, you know, by, by engaging with these um, theoretical scenarios. We had a recent workshop where we had a director that said to us later, everything that came up in here that my team was so freely telling me as all the concerns that they've obviously been sitting with about what they've been doing but no one wants to tell me the the quit the problems that they foresee you know and he just said just thought it was marvelous that by throwing this hypothetical scenario at them it sort of freed them to to voice these concerns about some of the shortfalls or the potential problems down the road and how helpful they hit that hit that he found that so i think it's a really really uh, important aspect of what we do is holding that space for the negative conversations and sort of forcing organizations to, to have them, even though it's, it's uncomfortable and many of us would prefer to just put on a brave face and, and keep marching forward. Holding the space for the negative conversations. What a great word. Um, well, we've come to the end of our time and um, let's maybe 
take stock of what we reached. That was one point. Um, another was that there is no ideal time frame for foresight. It's a permanent process that has to be undertaken at all different stages in the policy cycle. We have to adapt if scenarios change or are no longer in reach. We can't say this is the report for the next five years. We have to go through with it. Um, we have failed to address um, really how we can cater for future generations, the unborn generations. What we do in foresight is, we mentioned it, 10, 15, 20 years. We're talking about 50 or 70 maybe. Um, we have uh, all taken note of how strategic foresight can support policy makers. Um, the important questions linked to some of the technologies that are going to be used or not in the near future. And uh, we have heard that um, in Finland, each and every law is submitted to a foresight study and that uh, you can see foresight written everywhere. And I hope this will be the case uh, in our work in the European Union in the near future too. I know that has a lot improved and we will look into this in the following panel too. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you.